Freedom Planet is greater than the sum of its parts. It has shitty Sonic OC character design, which are in some depictions appealing and in others appalling, music which sounds vaguely unsatisfying outside of the game, and a pointless decorative life system. But when you play it, player control is pristine, the music complements the visual aspect perfectly, and the interaction between the player and the game make it an experience I keep coming back to. It's short, succinct, and it's the bee's knees, baby! God, I feel stupid. Let's see, this game's story does not exist. There is no story to be found here, trust me. This is a game about running fast and kicking robots. Let's see, Green Thing and This Thing are decent, but Lilac has so many more movement options for invincibility, speed, and height that her game is the only canon. Built upon the groundwork of running, jumping, and attacking lies a myriad of utilities and skills such as the Dragon Boost, which provides a burst of speed in one of six directions, a Cyclone Double Jump, which doubles as damage, a Drop Kick for quick descents, an uppercut, and a crouching kick. Where the green cat requires a wall or an environmental object to ascend, the purple one has two different ways to do it herself, and multiple angles and variations of these moves for maximum movement options. Where Mila cannot gain speed easily on her own, Lilac has again the dragon boost. It's simply the best move. But Lilac doesn't stop there. She has a few secret abilities and exploits to give her even more of an edge. Her cyclone uses up boost energy, but can be cancelled at any time with a kick or a drop kick for more frequent boosts as well as higher damage output. Drop kicking onto a decline just right gives her instant max speed. The dragon boost has a slight delay during which the player can slide slightly to the left or the right for course correction, or they'll freeze in midair. The Cyclone ability, used with the momentum of a spring, gives crazy height. Lilac's basic kick is her highest base damage output, and it does not affect nor is affected by her speed or position at all. The Dragon Boost grants a brief invincibility period, allowing for defensive tactics, especially during boss fights. This is very, this is a get out of jail free card. There's a secret super uppercut by pressing jump and attack at the same time while holding up, which can be chained with the Dragon Boost and the Cyclone to jump over most obstacles. She's got a lot of movement options, what can Carol do? Well, now that I look it up, Carol's list of movement tech exceeds the length of Lilac's. The problem is that Carol's moves are more situational and particular, and they require more extensive routing to really get the most of. Mila's speedrun time is shorter than both the other girls, but due to her limited ability and place in the plot, she gets to skip a few sections. Her big block blast boosts her high and far, but it's difficult to consistently perform. Lilac's main exploits, Cyclone Cancelling and Spring Cycloning, are so easy to do that they become second nature and legitimate additions to her moveset. Her Cyclone plus Cyclone Cancel gives her a surprising amount of dodge potential during boss boss fights, which I feel strangely lacking with Carol. When I suddenly have to commit to my jumps again, I seem to get caught in enemy attack patterns more often. Green Cat gets invincibility when she Chun-Li kicks, but that depletes meter real fast, and what do you do then, brother? With a Tornado Dragon, I effortlessly float above most attacks. It's surprising how much evasion Lilac gets with a simple cancelable hover. Lilac's moveset makes her overall a more forgiving, responsive, and able-bodied character to play. As an additional preference, Lilac is the only playable character in the game whose few voice lines aren't completely insufferable. While Lilac's... <laughs> is a fine delivery, and the literal meaning is sparingly light. Green Cats <laughs> Feel my power. makes me cringe a little, and hey, that was fun. lacks a certain charm, both conceptually and in practice. Of the three character designs, Lilacs has the fewest inhibitions to rooting for, where Carol has an edgy biker vibe and Mila is a cutesy anime girl, Lilac is a strong independent woman who don't need no man. She's the straight-faced hero, and she kicks robots in the Face. Number two, game feel. The sound for jumping is this subtle, satisfying, which gives a sense of weight and presence in the world, but it also conveys these characters as lightweight and nimble due to the light, short nature of the sound. The fact that Lilac can't hit top speed without a hill and gravity, a spring, or a dragon boost makes speed something which is not only earned, but used purposely. Air resistance slowing ungrounded players down feels right. It's hard to describe how else it feels, but right. When one blasts at top speed and launches into the air and the air fights back, that is an interaction between the player and the stratosphere, and it adds life to the experience. Due to their speed and intensity, boss fights can feel as fast and windbreaking as running. All the basic moves in attacking and running and collecting gems feels alright, you know? It just, it just feels good. This is good. The dragon boost sound is distinctly sparkly. A bit feminine, but definitely a powerful and satisfying effect. The way certain moves hit for clicks of damage per second instead of hitting once makes the game feel more real-time and action-packed. And the fact that enemies can occasionally do this to you, sometimes hitting even faster, evokes intensity and stakes. Enemies don't damage on impact, which, on top of being a treasure of a convenience, transforms them in the player's eyes from some speed bump obstacle to a living being worthy of consideration and evasion. The very basics, the liquid formula of interaction in this game is well produced and well cooked. So let's take that cache movement system and put it in a world. When I think about smart 2D platformer design, I think of environmental tutorials and challenges in games such as Super Metroid and Shovel Knight. 
Freedom Planet definitely uses natural teaching tools, but the world is so open and the player's moveset is so versatile that guidance does not feel like the game's top priority. Freedom Planet is an A-plus simply for not forcing the player to stand on a slow-moving platform, waiting for it to strut to another slow-moving platform and jumping between the two. Fast gameplay, right? The levels are designed to be run-through, filled with slopes, springs, and loops, roller coaster type things. And fun to run through they are. Freedom Planet is filled with moments and arrangements which make the game feel alive and free. Often bosses will bully the player throughout the level before throwing down, escalating tension and creating a grudge match to clash and climax against. Once the clash finishes, an instantaneous act transition occurs and the music and the environment give the player a breather, a falling action, before doing it all over again. This is a perfect distillation of basic action movie pacing, and I drink it up! I drink it right up! Exciting, interesting, fun moments pepper this game at an even and pleasant pace. Moments such as skipping the block switch in Dragon Valley makes the player feel clever and tricky. Running from a giant boulder here, unlocking the secrets in Relic Maze in order to open up a temple, only to have its legendary gem stolen right in front of you! The running and jumping becomes less mindless, with little contexts surrounding the adventure, and they are everywhere, whether scripted or environmental. These cutscenes are short and punchy, quickly careening the player back into the game before impatience sets in. Just long enough to establish context, and no more. It also helps that most gimmicky set pieces in the game send players up and to the right, which is where they want to go anyway. This focused aspect makes these objects less like obstacles which mess with the player's momentum, and more like devices the player wants to interact with to further their goal. Less diegetic objects, such as power-ups, are equally thought through. Placement of elemental shields are set up to make the player think about their approach. An electric shield is found on the third ship of Sky Battalion, granting an immunity to spikes and electricity. It's fun to slip past a bed of spikes and be granted immunity to set spikes for the return trip, but the shield also helps immensely for the following mini-boss and big boss of the level. And that feels so right. There is a fire shield in the beginning of Jade Creek's second half, in which the water rises and falls, making the player want to avoid the rising water surface before it puts out their fire. These particular shields, their effects, and placements make players think about their surroundings and routes. Hexagon shields attract energy crystals, so speedrunners really just want to grab onto that one and hold onto it forever. This is what polish is, giving the player useful abilities which synergize with their moveset and environments to create interesting scenarios. There are moments in the game where enemies are hurt or are killed by other enemies in the environment, which is fair, which gives the fictional space yet another aspect of life, but it also tells the player a story of who is top dog, of how much this alien bug commander cares about him, consequential little enemies compared to his murderous intent, and the like. A story is told through interactivity between entities during play, and that's wonderful. Instant kill death traps are thankfully sparse, never breaking up the pace, always being fair, always making sense, and always well telegraphed. The coolest moment in the entire game happens right here in Final Dreadnought 2. The color scheme goes from easy, light greens pleasantly downplaying the red alarm lights, to dark blues and purples, and the music becomes subdued and tense. Enemies once thrown haphazardly and hordes of the player are now strategically placed to choke them and whittle down their health. The card key mechanic returns to force players to stop and assess their surroundings, to force them to delve into beastly bellies and come out alive. And then... this. You're forgetting something important about the troops. They don't need oxygen. The main villain shuts down the oxygen on the ship and tries to fucking suffocate you. Now every twisty door, every turn button is another two seconds closer to your drowning. Every danger in sight risks breaking your bubble shield, your lifeline in this pit of pressure. Lord Brevin has just established himself as a serious threat through live interaction with the player. This is an intense and extreme experience, and it's the coolest thing ever. Bubble shields which are given to you by the little dog friend. That's a pleasant evocation of cooperation there, during play, having serious ramifications to you and your game state. Similar to how these friends sometimes joined in for boss fights. It's jolly cooperation, naturally integrated. I could keep going. After all that slow, methodical tension, the next round ups the energy again in a quick, breezy, brightly colored run. Team Girl Squad is gaining the upper hand, conveyed through the littering of boost panels giving free speed, the high-octane music track, and the sheer number of enemies you simply run past to get to your determined goal. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait a second. Is that a bubble shield? You know, that thing that kept you alive just minutes before? That's real cheeky, game. Ha <laughs> ha! I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Just when players think that they have the upper hand, Brevin captures one of their friends, threatens to slit her throat, and then transforms her into a freak show super mutant. This is riveting stuff. This is extremely engaging. This is an emotionally stimulating moment of the game with serious gameplay ramifications. You now have to fight this thing which used to be your cute dog friend. That's a thing you do. And her powers are what she had before and it's, oh man. It's so rad. And the boss fights. They are the best parts of this game. They are the flash, the climax, the fastest, most difficult, and most intense parts of the experience, and they kick some major serious booty. 
first playthrough, some of these guys, even mini-bosses, are going to wipe the floor with you, but on normal difficulty, their patterns are set, and so you can learn them, and learn them hard. In no time, players can dominate these ferocious, fast, and intimidating giants into a slow-motion explosion of sweet, ecstatic release. The fights are fair, well-conveyed, and forgiving, often giving the player opportunities to restore health mid-fight if they can earn it. It's good, and it feels right, and it's good. They can get easy once you learn the pattern, but if you want a difficult fight still, hard difficulty speeds up boss movement and randomizes their patterns, everybody wins. So I'm saying a lot of things, but let me level with you for a minute here. I have 75 hours clocked into Freaking Planet, a game which I can beat in a little over one. I am openly describing exploits and unintended shortcuts as parts of the moveset and routing of this game. That means that if you pick up Freedom Planet, which you absolutely should, which is what I am advocating here, your first playthrough isn't going to be as silky smooth and as high-flying as I'm describing. I really appreciate games which engage on the first run, but continue to reveal secrets as time goes on. Games in which the player learns more techniques and becomes proficient after continuous practice. The Avatar does not power up at all in a game like this. The base moveset is the moveset for the entire game. However, the degree to which the player grows elicits a genuine sense of long-term empowerment. This is Dust Force, this is Super Monkey Ball, and this is Freedom Planet. Part of the reason I keep playing the same hour of content over and over again is because it feels good to do it so well compared to the first or second run. Freedom Planet developers have stated that each level in this game should take, on average, 10 to 15 minutes to beat. The in-game achievement for speedrunning the first level individually is 5 minutes. But I can beat Dragon Valley in under 3 minutes at my best, and that takes effort and skill. It's rewarding to achieve such a short time even though it's a solid 30 seconds behind the world record. I blaze past most of the game with little threat of dying and being sent back to a checkpoint, but the prospect of improving my overall time combined with the experience itself keeps my interest high during the entire run. The main game rewards detailed exploration with dumb collectible cards and fun little events, and that's the initial draw. But now that I'm here, I'm thinking about the environment as I sprint through it. I want to think of how to optimize my play, but only as I'm playing it. I don't want to watch a speedrunning guide and follow their steps to the T, that's the point where it becomes tedious work. Now I often watch speedruns to gain basic techniques and to get a better idea of routing, but never explicitly copying it. That's when I lose a sense of self-expression, and agency is when I'm following the leader's route. I play with some skill, but refuse to commit on a professional level. I get to brag about how good my time is, but don't get the glory of the more impressive players because I don't want to work for it. Every run I try to memorize the level a little more and, on the fly, without pre-routing, try to think up faster and more efficient strategies. Is that a past time? Is that what a past time is? It's kind of an archaic, arcade game appeal. Which is weird because by the time I could hold a controller, arcade platformers were dead. This game is super good, alright? That's what I'm going for here. It's real good. I want the people who made Freedom Planet to feel good about themselves for creating a delightful piece of art. I want people to play this game and hopefully be enriched by it, and I want all the Kickstarter backers of this game to pat themselves on the back for gambling on Red 22 and actually winning. Whoever the Butter Dragon is, he must have pretty good taste in video games. Freedom Planet inspires me. It makes me want to run fast and kick robots. It makes me want to work hard to achieve my goals, and it gives me hope that I can achieve them. It makes me want to go outside and exercise, and it makes me want to practice my craft until I can make something as competent and as pleasant as this. It makes me feel good. It's perfectly stimulating. It is a complete success in my eyes. Freedom Planet is a cut above the rest. It's a big favorite of mine. This unique IP has earned its solitary throne.